just turned 20 and is a professional speaker. What? Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Dupree, scouring the globe to bring you stories of courage, passion, and resilience. If I could sum up this podcast into one word, I would use empathy. Now let's get inspired. Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I am your host, Brett Dupree, your Joyous Expansion host. It has been a while since my last podcast, roughly four months since the last episode. My bad. Maybe three. I don't know. I probably should look it up before I actually started that. This interview was actually supposed to go at the end of September. So a lot of the information that Mark Perez, the person who I am interviewing, isn't going to be up to date. My bad. A lot of interesting things have happened in the last four months since my last podcast. Number one, I got a girlfriend. Isn't that nice? Number two, I have been feeling overwhelmed. And when I feel overwhelmed, I tend to shut down. It doesn't seem 100%, what's the word, easy for me to see sometimes. Mostly because I'm still doing things. For instance, starting off the Lightworker Toastmasters and getting that up the ground. That takes so much of my energy. And a lot of the energy I used is energy that apparently came from doing this podcast. And the fact that getting people to be a part of the podcast all of a sudden started to slow down. And I got stuck in my old trap of not seeing the many views as I'd like. As not seeing as many guests as I like. And allowing myself to kind of let this go feeling overwhelmed for instance especially the editing and just feeling that tightness in my chest when I'm editing somebody and that feeling in the back of my head because that's how I know when I'm feeling overwhelmed is I feel tightness in my chest and the back of my head I think that's where the fight and flight mechanisms are and basically I was I got to say is that I messed up. I created this podcast as a way to make sure that I stick on track. I even kind of put up these interviews of trying to get many in a row to make me feel obligated to the person to make sure I get them out on time. And that didn't work out. That didn't work out at all. Mostly because it's now February something something when this goes out. Hopefully the 10th in the evening I'll finally get this out. Because I just want to get it out as soon as possible. And at least do one more of probably just me. Because I don't have any interviews more lined up. So maybe I can get another one. I don't know. We'll see. We'll hope. We'll pray. But basically, it's been an interesting road. I hit my anxiety hit about end of August. By this life uncertainty. This feeling of my contract was ending and then and what if I would become full time and then I have to pay my taxes and that kind of made me feel like I couldn't catch up financially and the funny part is is this month I was going to catch up financially and my because of my day job and I had this feeling that something's going to go wrong because every time every time every time it felt like that I was about to get forward in my finances something would happen I would lose my job car trouble my tires would go out. Something. Something that would happen that would throw my life into disarray. And I could feel that to the point where any time I got a call from or my boss would come up to me and talk to me at my job, my thought was, oh no, I'm going to be fired. And he could just be saying hi and have a friendly, just have a smile on his face. And generally speaking, when you're let go, as been let go, they generally don't do it with a smile. And they seemed pretty happy with me at my job as well. I mean, they hired me to be a full-time temp, which is a beyond a contractor. And I would explain it to you, but I still don't fully understand it. But now I have benefits. And I already set up my acupuncture. And I'm going to see if I can talk to a therapist. I always wanted to try therapy. Thinking maybe having someone to talk to will help me through that aspect of my life as my 40s I really want to get that down and to be honest I have been behind on that my desire to get my outside reality does not affect my inner reality inner reality because when you have no enemies on the outside the in, no in wait opposite you have no enemies on the inside there's no enemy on the outside that can do you harm the old African proverb that I heard from Les Brown I believe in 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 a, in a, in a very real sense I was starting to do pretty good, but then I got to the point of, I got to a point and it just didn't work out like I hoped. 
didn't work out like I hoped. But that's life, a constant learning experience. I remember when I was young, I thought there'd be a point in life where I would get it and it would all be over and it would be smooth sailing. Unfortunately, that has never happened. But I don't want to talk about life like it's completely been bad in the last four months. The Lightworker Toastmasters have been amazing. Every week I go has just been energizing. I've been a mentor to many people there. And it's been a lot of fun going to each meeting. I am closer to my DTM in Toastmasters. Thinking of doing more leadership to help build up my leadership skills. Even though my speaker skills are on point. And it would be fun to work on competing again for next year. But... We'll see. We'll see what happens. If I get a leadership role or if I don't, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But anyway, that's stuff that's not... Ooh, I just hit my pop filter. That is stuff that's not... That I can control. What I can control is my thoughts, my mind, and my body. And I really want to start working on that. So a lot of this podcast, if I don't get interviews, I want to still try to do this on a weekly basis of me just talking about me and my life. So it'll be more of this first part than having the interview and what I've learned on my life. And I think this helps. I think this helps me, mostly. Living a life with anxiety, mostly social. And it's one reason why I want to be an anxiety coach, because I truly understand. I've been coached by some great people who honestly didn't get it. Because a lot of times they're... They were kind of like Nike, in a sense, where their coaching was just do it. And... (laughs) Even when I go to certain schools, it seems like how they talk about that you have certain clients that you fire. I would be the type of client that would be fired because I have big dreams and almost no follow through. I mean, part of the part is I was listening to Russell Brunson's how there's dreamers, doers, and managers. People who are great at, or is it sellers? Dreamers, yeah, it was managers. There's three types of people. There's people who are great at dreaming and coming up with ideas. And there's people who are doers who are good at the sales and actually putting things into action. And then there are the managers who are really good at making sure everyone's doing what they're doing. And one of the successful ways of growing a business is setting people up to work in their er almost their natural area of expertise. And my natural area of expertise is I'm a dreamer. I love coming up with ideas. I'm not a big fan of following through with them. That's including this podcast. I love almost like the idea of this podcast more than actually doing the podcast. And then you top that on with like manager. I just don't really like asking for help. And that's something I want to work on. It's one of the reasons why I want to go to into more, more leadership experience and Toastmasters to get a place to practice my managerial skills and to learn and to push myself because that's why I want that's why I do a lot of things that's why I'm doing this podcast I need to push myself and that's how I grow is to push myself that's the important part about life I think and to work on not retreating I told myself I wasn't and here I am four months later telling you that I did exactly what I told myself I wouldn't do with this podcast I, quote unquote, failed. But just like Spider-Man in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the thing that makes a hero a hero is not the fact that they fall, it's the fact that they get back up. And right now, this recording is me getting back up. Getting back up my podcast, getting back up in my health, getting back up in my mental acuity and becoming the person I know I am and working towards making this world a better place through my gifts. And one of my gifts is interview. I love interviewing people. One of my gifts of talking gif. One of my gifs is <laughs> talking to people. Sorry, that's a joke that only I get. Maybe gifs or gifs. Gifts are talking to people and really working on my message and getting it out there and touching people and connecting with people. I was doing Simon Sinek's Find Your Why. And and the way you find your why is you write down a bunch of stories and you have someone try to get to the why in the stories. And I was going to do it online and I only ended up doing one of the stories. But something about that story really hit me. It was about wrestling. And how my entire wrestling goal, like, well, my entire wrestling goal is I wanted to win my last match. And that started out as a story on, and my thought process while I was doing it was this idea that 
I don't set my goals correctly and trying to find my why into that. But the more I thought about wrestling, the more I thought about my life in general and where I thrive, what I love. And I love being around people, which, you know, being someone who I used to have crippling social anxiety, that's something that it kind of shocked me. Because, but when I thought about it, I really liked being around my group friend, my group of friends. I felt great, and, but most of us feel great about being a group of friends. But I loved being a member of, I love football, and I loved being a member of a football team. Loved it. It was one of my favorite things. I probably did not like a good 30% if, of the people on the team, or were just not the same type of, maybe not dislike. More along the lines, there wouldn't be, wouldn't be people that I would hang out with. And we didn't exactly hang out much. I only hang out with my core group of friends. And only one of them was on the football team. So it's not like I made great football friends. I mean, if I saw one now, it would be like, yay, football. But we're adults now. In high school, I was like, I'm shy. Don't talk to me. But I loved being a part of the team. And wrestling. I did not like wrestling. I wrestled because I was good at it. I mean, it's the reason why I didn't do shot put. I was terrible at shot put. Even though I was strong, I was... mm, I think it was just the way my arms are so short and my torso. I just not have a shot put body. And so I did not want to do shot put in high school because I suck. And I don't like sucking at things. But wrestling, I was good. My first match, I pinned someone in 10 seconds. He was terrible. But at the same time, I did do that. And I just had, I mean, I have a short, stubby body that's really strong. So it was really hard for people to wrestle me. And so just... Being that, and I'm a decent athlete, so I was good at wrestling, so I stuck at wrestling. But one thing I loved about wrestling was being a part of a team and being surrounded by people and working towards striving for a goal. And then I started thinking about more of my life, more of who I am, more of what makes me me. And the thing that I love, absolutely love, are seminars. I love going to seminars. I love being around people. I love surrounding myself with people. That energy, that electricity and working towards improving and seeing other people improve. I love it. In fact, one of my dreams is just do a year, a year where I do nothing but go to seminar after seminar after seminar because I love it. It just, it's amazing. Another thing that I love is group meditations. I love just being part of a group and meditating and getting together and just doing that. And it's amazing. It's awesome. I love it. Another thing I loved back when I was working on getting in shape before I just could not afford it anymore, CrossFit. I loved CrossFit. The workouts are fun, even though they could be painful. The thing I loved most about CrossFit was working with people. Being in a group of people and working towards a goal together. In fact, my favorite part of CrossFit was the end where we just had to do our cool down. We were off from one end to another. We're all giving each other high fives, telling us what a great job we did. I love that. So basically my point is, is just looking at myself and being honest with myself is when I'm part of a group where we're all going towards a desire to grow, to build, and to be a part of that and leading that, that is my why. I love it. Love it. And that is what I'm going to focus on and drive me. And I'm going to use this podcast to help me. Because there's even sharing this podcast out into the ether and being part of that group, I don't like journaling because that's just me. But I like blog posting the things I would journal. This podcast is more fun for me than sitting down. I've been thinking about my anxiety for a while. And I just did a Facebook Live about it. And I feel so much better because I did that. Because it shared it out into the ether. And the thought that somebody watched that and it improved energizes me. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So I guess I need your help to remind me. Anyway, let's go on. Because this podcast does have an interview. Let's go on with today's interview. As a... TEDx youth motivational speaker, world class speaking coach, and occasional stand up comedian, Mark travels to remind people why they are here. When people commit to their one thing in life, great progress happens. And that is how we make solving world problems easy. Now, here's my interview with the great youth motivational speaker, Mark Perez. Hello, Mark Perez, and welcome to my podcast. Hello. says here that you are a speaking coach. How'd you get into that? After doing my TEDx talk, I went to the District 2 Fall Conference, and we saw Craig Valentine, very good speaker. I wanted to know 
more of what he does. And so I went online and I looked up Craig Valentine. And I signed up for his 52 speaking tips. I guess I was added to his email list. And so he kept sending his email list all these announcements about his world-class certified speaking program. And after a while, I just figured, you know, why not give it a shot? So it's been really exciting. And today I'm actually going to be coaching uh, Joe Cardi, D2 winner for uh, semifinals in the international contest. That's exciting. For the listeners who don't know, he's talking about a group organization that we're both a part of, which is called Toastmasters, where we work on our public speaking. Joe Cardi was our district champion. What a great speech he gave. So what got you into public speaking? That started, I think, my junior year of high school when I was asked to give a speech to my team's cross-country banquet. And it was a five-minute speech, and it was the first time I'd been given an opportunity like that. And I really liked it. And the next year, I did the same thing. I helped MC a few assemblies at my high school. And I realized, you know, I'm going to graduate high school, and I'm not going to be in cross-country anymore. But I need something that gives me that kind of excitement as, you know, running a race word. And public speaking was that thing that kept me going. Yeah, public speaking does have that high afterwards. I keep on calling people. Don't need to go skydiving. I just need to get up in front of people. (laughs) So tell the listeners how old you are. I am 19 years old. I'm going to be 20 on the 30th this month. Ah, congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you. (laughs) So you are a younger entrepreneur. How are the anxieties of being a younger entrepreneur and going for it? You know, it's surprisingly less anxiety inducing as school is because I'm in more control of what I'm doing. I'm in more in control of what I'm learning. And you're allowed to make your own mistakes without any record consequences. Like if you fail a class, that's on your record. You can't change that. But if you missed out on a speaking engagement because of a bad email or a not so successful phone call, you just move on to the next client and just you move on. It's one person to the next and you just learn as you go on. It's really cool. What has been one of your biggest lessons that you've learned so far? I would learning is limitless. Like you're never going to stop learning. There's never going to be something that life or the universe, whatever you want to call it, will teach you. I know I have a, on the top of my desk that I'm sitting on, I have over 20 books that I've read in the last year displayed because each and every single one of those books has taught me something. And it's been really cool to be able to actually apply it. What has been one of the most helpful things that you learned and applied out of the 20? It depends. Like, for example, at work, I would point out one of my leadership books, Simon Sinek's Start With Why, or uh, Susan Cain, her book, Quiet. It's all about knowing why you do what you do. It's about being true to what you are. It's about being you know, your most authentic self. In terms of public speaking, I read this book called The Brilliance Breakthrough. It was a $200 book, and it was just very thorough in what it takes to be a great speaker. One of the best books I ever read in terms of self-growth, Mindset by Carol Dweck. It just taught me the importance of having a growth mindset. Wow, $200 for the book. Last time I paid that much, I was in college. (laughs) No, just check it out. I, I think it's worth a read. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> so how does it feel when you go up? Because you actually speak to high schools. Yeah. How does it feel to be in front of all those high school students? You know, I, I'm i happy to say that I've reached this tipping point where the way I feel on the stage is the same as I feel off the stage. I used to def- I used to feel nervous for sure. It was just, you know, just sweaty palms and the fast beating and of my heart and lately I've noticed just any stage that I'm on the transition is really smooth there's no like trying to overcome that nervousness but it's really exciting because in Toastmasters your audience is over 30 so you know people who have jobs and careers so it's a lot harder for me to relate whereas with high school students I am the same character but they resonate With me more, not only because I look like them, but the message that I give is what they want to hear. So other than Toastmasters, have you spoke to any older audiences? 
Not that I can think of. No, it's mainly anything outside of actually my TED talk. When I did my TEDx talk, I would say there was a good amount of people that were older than me. How was that experience giving your first TED talk? You know, I a lot of people ask me, you know, what's your favorite thing about doing a TED talk? And if I'm going to be honest, I think it was the food that they catered for. That was uh, <laughs> that was probably my most favorite. But it was a very, it's a genuinely amazing character building experience because not only is it just about spreading an idea, but it's making sure you're living and breathing that idea. That they, the coaches, they did a good job in keeping you grounded to your idea because my biggest issue was I had so many ideas and I was trying to implement all these ideas into the idea that I had interviewed for and well yes they were like okay well there's something we can pull out here there's something we can pull out there but we don't need everything all at once and I know one of my coaches he gave me this quote he said if you're gonna speak speak clearly and speak simply otherwise keep making progress and that's a public speaking tip that I've been following ever since. So during your public speaking career at first, did you ever have any doubts that you can do this? Oh, absolutely. I know it's towards the beginning when I was like, okay, what is a business? What's marketing? What's, you know, networking? How does all this work? It's just, it's overwhelming. But, you know, as Craig Valentine would say, uh, there's a, there's magic in the mess. If you can sort out the mess, there's truly something magical there. And so I, Slowly over time with reading and experience learned how to organize the messes of owning a business like speaking or being like with Toastmasters and just so how the importance of self growth that goes with it. You keep on mentioning Craig Valentine. Can you explain who he is? Yes, yeah, so in nineteen ninety nine he competed in the international speech contest held by Toastmasters and he actually won the world championships and now he goes around to just about he's a very universal speaker i like to call him because he'll go to any group like toastmasters or company and present on how to be a better public speaker and watching him it was a big stepping stone because not only did i see that you could be a speaker on how to be a better speaker but he helped me in my speaking as well that reminds me of something you said earlier mm -hmm. in 2011 i actually make it made it i went to the district conference that's the first time i saw craig valentine speak. Oh, okay and then i believe two years ago he w came back to our conference yeah and he improved a lot during those five years <laughs> so, and it's amazing to me because he was so good five years ago like amazing <laughs> but now he's more amazing yeah and what i like about him is he believes, like, in order to grow, you know, you have to believe in education, not validation. He was telling us about how he reinvested himself in the art of public speaking. He, he's, he also gets speech coaching. He, even though he's a world champion, you, you know, you can't beat that. But he still gets coached. He still finds people to help him out. He still takes feedback from his audience. And that just proves that you can be a world champion, but that doesn't mean you can't get better. Yeah, he's quite an inspirational person. Oh, absolutely. So what got you into wanting to become an actual speech coach to actually help other people with their public speaking? It was an email Craig sent. I wasn't thinking about it, but uh, you know how I told you about, you know, that book Start With Why by Simon Sinek? Well, he had another book, Find Your Why, and that was all about, you know, finding your life's why. And in that, I was able to find mine. And it's a very cool experience, a book to read. and to really sum it up, my why is to spread the idea of universal ownership so that united we make exponential progress in the world and in our lives. And there's no better way to help people make progress in their lives and in the world than to coach them in some form or fashion. Coaching is one of those things that helped me live out that why. Awesome. So my question, uh, Joseph Hardy, I know he's probably in his 30s. How do you think of do you have any mental blocks or how do you work through the mental blocks of coaching people who have probably have some have even you know given public speakings for as long as you've been mm. alive so how do you work with that you know my biggest pitch right now is that i am younger and a lot of people a lot of adults in their 30s and 40s want to resonate with the younger audience because you know they're, we're the people that are slowly moving up 
in you know the position that they were once in we were we're the people in their position not like 20 years ago and stuff my thing with working with people who are a lot older than me is i'm here to give you the insight that nobody else will i'm here to give you the first person point of view of what it's like to be a millennial or someone a generation z perspective and that's something that's very invaluable to a lot of people as for the mental blocks it's definitely like it's weird at first our the toastmasters district two director molly george i asked if she wanted speech coaching and i was honestly surprised when she was like yes i would love that and she asked me you know what does make you qualified and i told her about my program a world-class certified speaking coach and uh, she goes yes i would love to do that i would love to get your perspective and when she said that that's when i realized there's something everybody has to offer even if you don't see it one thing that i like what you said is you kind of took what some people can think as a negative and you spun it into a positive (laughs) you're able to pivot so do you work on pivoting a lot the ability to take a negative and turn it into a positive oh absolutely in my program, this is the, probably the best, most recent example I have. My accountability partners, Lefford Fate and John Andrews, we were going through each other's stories and giving each other feedback, role-playing, coach and client. And when it became my turn to be the client, I was stuck on one of my stories in my keynote for high school. I felt like I was limited in the amount of points I could tell with this story. And my accountability partner said, no, 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 Mark. You see, here's the thing. What's hard is that you're trying to fit two points or three points in the same story. You can't do that. You have to fit one point per story. And what he ended up doing was he took what I thought was a limited story. He branched out seven different points in the same story that I could make just based on the way I could tell it. Wow. Yeah. Seven. (laughs) So when working with people, what has been one of your favorite uh, stories of clients so far? So yeah, my accountability partners are two of my favorites because for me, right now my experience would be help, like I'm helping out a friend with his two-hour presentation he gives for financial advisors. And right now it's for him, he needs structure. Whereas John and Lefford, who are really good speakers. Lefford is a $10,000 speech kind of guy. And John, he was in the, he was one of the finalists uh, last year for the international speech contest, where they need refinement. And I like the refinement because you have to truly, really focus and narrow down what you're listening for. Listen for like the play on words, whereas someone who's doing his first two hour speech, it's more of, okay, here's your structure to help you find some stories. What is the importance of having an accountability partner? It has been absolutely phenomenal. I'm happy to say that Leopard, he told me to sign up for this. It's a platform called Gig Masters, and it's just, if you have the account, it's a, you have to pay for it. It's 300 a year. And what it is, is if there's someone who wants a speaker, or if you have a certain skill, like let's say you are a comedian or a hula hoop dancer or something like that, you can sign up for this and people who are looking for your specific skill set, Gig Masters will send you a message. And because of Leffer's advice of signing up, I booked my first paid speaking engagement in Richland, Washington. Wow, exciting. Well, the speaking engagement, not Richland, Washington. <laughs> That's so cool. What are you going to speak about in Richland? So I have my keynote that I give to high school. Just, the idea is I am. And it's Spawns from this author, Gilbert Chesterton. I'll say it one more time. It's a little hard. Gilbert Chesterton. And he wrote this book called uh, What's Wrong with the World? And it's a very funny book. It's a really, it, it's just, it's worth a read. Anyway, there's this story. It's like a legend that the London Times in the early 1900s sent out an inquiry. And in that inquiry, they sent this question to a bunch of famous authors at the time, asking the question, what's wrong with the world? All the authors were sending back, oh, it's, you know, the politicians, the corporations, it's people who don't want to take action. It's, they're basically, they're blaming everybody else. But Chesterton, he writes back, dear London Times, in regard to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am. I am everything wrong with the world. Yours truly 
Gilbert Chesterton. And it, I, I thought it was funny at first, but it had me thinking, one, who named their kid Gilbert? But two, <laughs> what if everybody felt that way? You know, well, what if everybody said I am? What kind of exponential progress would we make in the world? And that's what I'm going to go to Richmond to talk about. Wow, that sounds like a very powerful message. I know, it's definitely a really cool idea. <laughs> what kind of responses do you get from the high school kids? I When I went to Lake Washington High School, uh, <laughs> there was one student in the middle of my presentation. He comes up to me. He shakes my hand. He says, this is the best thing I've ever heard. I have to get out of here before the principal catches me skipping my class again. <laughs> <laughs> and, thank you so much. All right, now go... <laughs> He was skipping his class to be in his leadership class. He had already been in leadership in first period, but this was fourth period. He comes up to me, and that's when I realized, you know, you know you have a message that people resonate with. If in the middle of it, they're willing to come up in front of you and say thank you. When I went to Tahoma High School, for the first time ever, I, I got a standing ovation in the class because of my one point. It's life's little life-changing secret. It's the secret to happiness, and I can't tell you because it's a secret. But after I told that point, and I did my whole dramatic role play, and I delivered my line, everybody started clapping. There's only 20 people in a room. And in a room of 20 people, you don't usually get a standing ovation. In that engagement that I learned, it's not about how good of a speaker you are, but it's about what you're willing to give the audience. And that, that's just a huge paradigm shift. Just it's not about how good you are. It's about what you give. So how do you help people give more to the audience? By As a coach, I look for the story that truly inspire them. Story that, you know, as a kid or, you know, a young person, you know, what, what stood out to you? What, what was it that, even if it's bad, like even if it was like a bad moment, it stands out. For example, what was it? My friend, he's a financial advisor in Bellevue. He's a, he's a fairly wealthy guy. And he asked me, hey, could you coach me? I said, yeah, sure. And he was telling me about how he had a boss. It was He worked at a McDonald's and his general manager was just so mean. Just ridiculed him. And but just, you're not going to make it in life. You're going to be stuck here at this McDonald's. And you're probably going to take the position I am. He was just very bitter. And I go, what, what was great about that? And he mentions his friend, Stephen. And Stephen took nothing seriously. He would laugh at the general manager. He couldn't take angry customers seriously, which if you're at a McDonald's, it's not exactly high quality. But Stephen didn't really let anything bother him. So he would make my friend laugh. And he was telling me that if the world was just a little bit more like Stephen, everybody would be just that much more happy. Mm, that's a good way of yeah. pivoting <laughs> as well. So you look for that positive message in the nugget of the story. Absolutely. It's it, it's that phrase. It's the, if you ever were listening to our Craig Valentine keynote, he gives his, the dream is not for sale. It's sometimes it's not something bad that gets in the way of you living your dream, improving as a person. It's actually settling for something good. Just don't settle. Doesn't sound like you've settled. Way to go, no, man. No. <laughs> Thank you. So what do you like most about being a coach? It's the adrenaline rush of finding the phrase. It, it's like a lot of people say it's the stories, but it, it's, I love the idea of taking a feeling, an emotion that's hard to articulate with the words and then putting it into words. If you ever watch or listen to or read something from Brene Brown, she talks a lot about vulnerability. And when you're the most vulnerable, that's when your most creative ideas come out. That's when confidence come out. That's when true emotion and, and authenticity comes. It's finding people's vulnerabilities, not in a bad way, but, but it's finding that, you know, that, that, that spot in your core that causes the reaction and putting it into words. That's how you inspire an audience. And that's what I like the most. Yeah, there's really something about that. I know in my last year or so, I decided the thing I really want to work most in my speaking is that ability to connect with the audience. Mm -hmm. and my answer has been just to be as vulnerable as possible. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of people, when they think of vulnerability, they think, oh, it's, you know, vulnerability, you're, you're, you're weak if you're vulnerable. It's not, that's not what vulnerability is. It's, for example, my manager at Chick-fil-A, a place that I work, she is very adamant about making sure you're taking care of before she sends you to do your job. 
what that does is by making sure that you're taken care of first as opposed to her job as the lead, that's, that's being vulnerable because she's opening herself up to getting really ridiculed by her bosses and her, her supervisors. But because she takes that extra time to take care of us, like everything else falls in place. Truth. And I agree that it's a strength. I mean, even if you think about it, is who has more bravery? The person who's going into battle with full deck of armor or the person who's going completely naked? Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of bravery in being vulnerable. Absolutely. So you help people with their stories and getting the most out of their stories. Do you also help people with the fear of public speaking? Oh, absolutely. I I believe I have, I'm actually going to work on a another keynote that's designed for Toastmasters, any like a presentation on presentation keynote, and I'm going to call it like the holistic speaking or universal speaking. And the goal will be to help people feel the same way as they're giving a speech. It's basically that feeling you are, you have when you are giving a speech placed in that position right before us. Whatever you're feeling when you're giving a speech, I want you to feel that right before you're being introduced, because that's when you're the most nervous. And that's been a huge tool that I've been able to have as a speaker, just being able to go up out the worry of anxiety without, you know, sweaty palms and armpits, pulsating heart, because while it's good to be nervous, it is a lot more helpful if you can manage it and use it. Definitely. One thing I've... The theory I had is a nervous is just energy building up and you can use it to hurt you or you can use it to energize your speech. Yeah. I know uh, Simon Sinek, he was giving this talk about how the person, like an Olympic athlete, for example, they'll ask these athletes, you know, were you nervous before you went up? And they're like, no, we were excited. And if you look at the symptoms of excitement and nervousness, they're surprisingly the same. You know, your heart's beating faster, you're palms are sweaty and you know you're clenching your fist in excitement or you're clenching your fist in nervousness it's 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 the same sensation just a different perspective on it awesome so before we come to our end is there anything else you would like to talk about on your coaching practice i am still in the program becoming a certified world-class speaking coach and i am definitely looking to out of my scope and since i'm not certified and uh, i'm just starting out i will i'm actually looking for a lot of people to coach for free as i mentioned i'm coaching our d2 winner joe cardi i'm going to coach the district leadership and i look forward to working with people and helping them become much more phenomenal speakers awesome well i'll definitely love to get some coaching from you man <laughs> hit me up <laughs> all right we are about coming to our end of our speaking time which is what we call podcasting is two people speaking to each other and i like to ask my speakers or my guests to do a one minute of motivation a one minute that you would like to distill your message or leave the audience or imagine if you have a time machine and go back to your eight-year-old self and just give yourself you only have one minute to give him the motivation and inspiration he needs to move forward Okay. So are you ready? Yes, let's do it. Awesome. So I want you to imagine two dogs, one of whom we'll call him Dexter, and Dexter is hyperactive, he's energetic, and we'll call the other one Abe, and Abe is very chillax, he loves to just lay down and just watch as the time goes by, and as Dexter is running around, Abe is feeling uh, a little aggravated. And so A very calmly goes up to Dexter and he goes, hey, do you want another secret to happiness? And Dexter's like, well, yeah, a little bit. I, I don't see what would be wrong with knowing that. And so Abe goes, okay, happiness is on the tip of your tail. And so Dexter's, oh, perfect. All I have to do is get my tail. So Dexter starts to chase his tail over and over and over. And as Dexter is chasing his tail, the owner's watching the dog as he's chasing his tail, wondering what the heck is wrong with the dog. And Dexter just gets out of control. He starts spinning very clumsily he knocks over this really expensive lamp that his owner had bought and breaks it and the owner gets upset at the dog and the owner goes to work knowing about this broken lamp and it meant a lot to him and he goes to work angry and he gets all of his co-workers angry because he's in a bad mood and all of his co-workers are angry and they go home and they get mad at their families and their friends because they're in a bad mood because of that one co-worker and when you're angry and 
you're mad and frustrated, you're not you at your best self. So one of them tries to cook some food to make themselves feel better. And in their process of trying to cook, they actually leave the stove on, causing their house to catch on fire. And the house catches on fire and the whole house burns down and the entire neighborhood is up in flames and the fire department can't get control of it. And next thing you know, the neighborhood surrounding them catch on fire because the fire is just so big and everybody has to evacuate. As the entire neighborhood catches on fire, the trees and the forest around them catches on fire. Next thing you know, the entire state of Washington is on fire because it's just all trees. And because of that, the atmosphere temperature begins to rise. The polar ice caps begin to melt and the water level rises. And now my sock is wet. And Dexter... Finally realizing after it's too late, the power of a single thought, the secret to happiness wasn't to chase it, but to watch as it follows you everywhere you go. He learned as the world was falling apart that the secret to happiness is to live simple and watch as it follows you everywhere you go. Don't find happiness too late. <laughs> that is a great story. But I was off for like four minutes. You know, I, I really want to get it down to one. I tried. <laughs> so do you want to just try again and riff for one minute? Should I try it again for a minute? Two dogs are playing around, and one of them looks at the other and says, do you want to know the secret to happiness? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I do want to know it. So the other dog goes, okay, the secret to happiness is on the tip of your tail. The second dog goes, okay, so he starts chasing his tail. And for a few days go by, and the dog is chasing his tail, goes up to the other one and says, I've been chasing my tail, but I'm driving myself crazy. He said I would be happy. He said, yes. The secret to happiness is on the tip of your tail. But the trick is to live simply. Do what you're already doing and watch as happiness follows you everywhere you go. That was great. Better. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That will fit. Awesome, awesome. Anything else? No, that's everything. Sweet. So thank you for being on my podcast. I really enjoyed your message. I think you have a very good message to talk about and the secret to happiness is also really great i (laughs) enjoy seeing a youthful exuberance out of you you're my first younger person i've interviewed for this podcast Uh and the way you work through your trials and tribulations and helping people has been an inspiration and it's been a pleasure getting to know you in the last five months that i've gotten to know you so thank you so much for being on my podcast and thank you so much for making this world a better place thank you for doing the same And there you have it, folks. And that was Mark Perez. A lot of wisdom coming out of a 20-year-old mind. Age is just a number, really. And listening to all the books he listened to. And basically, that's how I started on my journey. Just listening to books, reading books. I say listening because while I did read a lot, my personal development very took off. Very took off? Really took off? exceedingly took off after I started using audible.com and listen to audiobook. I should have a partnership with them because I love audio audible.com. Anyway, I really liked his stance on change and a lot of things. And I thought he did a really good job on pivoting, as I mentioned over and over in the interview. The ability to take something that's negative or something along those lines and then flip it to a positive, which is one way I'm working on with my social anxiety. And the still lingering effects of that anxiety and pivoting to saying I, unlike a lot of coaches, truly understand what it's like to have anxiety and to want to do something amazing in this world. I would love to give a review of Mark's coaching, but unfortunately that hit towards the middle of my kind of breakdown cycle where doing a lot of extra things was hard for me and going through with his coaching was unfortunately one of them. I'm sure he did a great job. Joseph Cardi did an amazing job at the regionals. He is a he's a great speaker and yeah I've been fun watching Mark Perez grow and be very excited about his coaching and really learning. I don't know if there's any coaching sp- Bots free anymore that are available. I don't know how far along he is. I'll probably get in touch with him when I tell him that his interview is going out. Again, my bad. I mean, that's what life is, really, is taking what you are and learning how to work with it. And sometimes, for me, that is someone who doesn't always follow through with what he says he's going to do. Especially with himself. Self-integrity is one of the things I'm very much working on. 
But I also think it's very inspiring listening to somebody who is half my age. Jeez, I'm 40, he's 20. Man, I just realized that. But listen to someone who's half my age who seems to have a good head on his shoulders and is moving towards his goals, his desires, his dreams. And I really liked that perspective he had about being an entrepreneur is less stressful than school because of the freedom aspect of it. And if you mess up that you can just keep on pushing forward and there's no permanent record. If I can get that mindset in my brain, I know I would do to be doing a lot better because for me that just goes around and 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 around until all of a sudden I look down and see a tub of ice cream and the ice cream has magically disappeared. But he, if he has that down, in my opinion, the skies are limit for Mark Perez. If you're interested in learning more about Mark Perez, he has a website, Mark Perez, M A R K P E R E Z official dot com. There he has a free gift for you a want to be a three times as productive tomorrow as you are today or feel organized in your day to day life. He has a nice little download for you and also. See if he's still offering free coaching and give him an email. He has a contact on his page for a free strategy strategy, strategy session with Mark. That's Mark at MarkPerezOfficial.com. Even if he costs money, I'm sure it's very much worth it. As I have seen him speak, I actually, a little tidbit is for the Lightworker Toastmasters for the first meeting I had guest speakers and Mark Perez was one of the guest speakers. And the reason why Mark Perez was one of the guest speakers is because I've never seen him speak other than his TED Talk. And TED Talks are very formulated and you work on it really hard with the coach and everything. So I wanted to see the true, authentic, speaking Mark Perez, not the TED Talk performing Mark Perez. And he is a great speaker. I was very energized and for somebody of his age, increasingly impressed. I don't know why I say that. I'm impressed with him at any age. He's a very impressive man, period. Age is just a number and he does such a great job of speaking and the fact that he goes to high schools to speak, which I still think would be a biggest fear of mine. But basically speaking, the being in front of high school students, I think is commendable to speak to the youth. So listening to Mark Perez, someone who's energizing and changing lives, especially with the younger one and the sooner we can get, if someone can, if I got what I got when I turned 28, when I was 17, 16, 15, if I truly got that, I know my life would be much different different in a sense of of the ability to push forward and to know what is out there i mean we live in an amazing world where there's so many books and ways to communicate and even podcasts like this that weren't around 20 or so years ago when i was 20 such amazing world we live in right now and that is episode 14 of the joyous expansion podcast (laughs) only four months late that's not too bad don't you think I am Brett Dupree, your joyous expansion life coach champion of authentic joy. And I forgot the third one I said before, but I am that. Oh, Catalyst of Transformation. I love that one. Especially if you have social anxiety, I will work with you to become the greatest version of you. If you have a question that you'd like to ask for me, you can email me at brettdupree at joyousexpansion.com. That's B-R-E-2-T's, D-U-P-R-E-2-E's. Wait, messed up. D-U-R-P, D-U-P-R-E-E. Oh, man. See, I'm out of practice. Brett Dupree, B-R-E-T-T, D-U-P-R-E-E, at joyousexpansion.com. Of course, my website, of course, is joyousexpansion.com. Dot com. I also have a free gift for you to learn how to break through those anxieties and this, the thought processes I use to help push me forward and let me to get back up like Spider-Man. My podcasts are always available at pod.joyousexpansion.com to listen to the, all the other episodes. So if you like this, share it with somebody. Give me, If you're listening on iTunes or whatever, subscribe, like, review, whatever it takes. It'll help me out. Don't you like me? Please. (laughs) Just kidding. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, if you are listening to this right now, I love you for who you are. I truly appreciate the time we have spent together. And I remind you once again to be joy, to be love, to be awesome.
Now play that jingle! JoyousExpansion.com JoyousExpansion.com Come and say hello to Brad Dupree He is an inspirational life coach Good for you and good for me He turned my life from grey to blue I'm sure he'll do the same for you Get in touch and you'll see Your life will change dramatically JoyousExpansion.com JoyousExpansion.com Yeah!